Thank you, John. Um, so it's um, it's a great pleasure and a sort of sour pleasure and privilege to uh, celebrate the life of, of the author, Pierre Guillotin. Uh, he is, uh, he sort of reached a legendary status uh, over 50 years ago uh, in 1967 with a book called Top of 500,000 Soldiers, which was an epic of slavery, servitude, sexuality. And in 1970, with a book that immediately became uh, legendary called Eden, 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 which was a milestone um, in the decolonization of the world, as well as the shift in sexuality, gender politics, uh, cultural politics, as well as in the French language itself. And then further on from 1970 on to uh, a few months ago, they embarked on this extraordinary journey of changing the world, making a world based on the world that wouldn't be uh, the one we experience. So a world with new rules, new regulations, uh, new politics, but also changing the French language with books like Prostitution, Progenies, uh, more recently uh, Idioti, which will come out with a New York Review of Books within a couple uh, months as well as with a whole cycle of books that dwelled on autobiographical matters such as um, Thoma and In the Deep, uh, which Nora Vidal translated. So in a way, he was somebody who revolutionized language, revolutionized what human beings are, creating these creatures called whores, uh, whores in the masculine, not feminine, um, which were objects for experimentation of what being human uh, mean and what living in the world, uh, in a cosmological world, can mean. Uh, he was also somebody who had a very close relationship with the visual arts. Uh, he was a draftsman himself, and his work has been exhibited uh, in numerous places, including the box in Los Angeles. Um, he was a performer where we opened the Centre Pompidou. Uh, it was with his performance at the Centre Pompidou we opened in 2000. Uh, he was somebody who completely changed uh, the fabric of art, and he's also somebody whose work has had very important philosophical undertones for philosophers uh, as different as Catherine Malibu here, Alain Badiou, Michel Foucault, Roland Barthes, and, and many, many, Rebrassier, and many, many others. So, in a way, um, this was the idea for this conversation was not to uh, do a tribute, because tributes close a history, and we are actually aiming to open it up. 60%, probably other 60% of Pierre Guillotin's work is unpublished. So in a way, he invented this futuristic world, but his work also lies ahead. His work also exists in the future. So to celebrate this life, which is also um, something that he shaped because he very, he, part of his work has been to engage with what the life of, a, of an author means, the life of an artist, the life of a sexual being, the life of cosmology, uh, the life of biology, the life of history. And in a way, this notion of life has been at the very center uh, of all his work and will remain for the decades to come with the upcoming publication. So in, to celebrate, this life. I thought it could be interesting to bring in uh, three figures who've had very intense and very profound and very different uh, engagements with, with Pierre uh, Guillotin's person and his work. Nora, of course, translated Coma and In the Deep with Semiotex um, and has written extensively and in great detail and with great depth on, on Pierre's work. Uh, Paul McCarthy has uh, also, you know, followed Pierre Guillotin's writing, followed Pierre Guillotin's um, drawing, which you've exhibited, uh, with, you've exhibited with and you at, in Paris at Esdin Elias, and you also contributed to Foster at The Box with Mara McCarthy's show. And of course, Catherine, you've written this, you've, been, you've known Pierre for decades, but you've also written this incredible essay on the very notion of life, the way is the fabric of life was sort of presciently changing uh, in, his, in his work. So in a way, what we're going to try to do in the 40, 30, 35, 40 minutes to come is to sort of give an idea of how much he changed 
the very way we conceive life uh, in all its different uh, layers. So maybe I'll start with you, Nora, and ask you to react to what I just said. Do you think that what I'm saying is a bit far-fetched, or do you think that XPR actually did change the way we see life? Um, so let me think about that because it's a very yeah, interesting question. I guess I, I can begin by saying that Pierre is really, uh, and it's hard for me to speak in the past and I think, you know, I, I want to continue to speak in the present of him. If we're talking about his work, he um, really invested his work with his life. So there's a present tense of it that continues and the present tense of his awareness, I guess, that continues. Um, but I want to say first is that he had a real tenderness of awareness um, and he had a, a freshness, like a, a child's freshness. And so maybe just in response to your question, I don't know if he, I would say he really changed um, how we view life. For me, that's the, I haven't really thought about it that way, but um, he was pondering the question of how to be um, tender and how to maintain an innocence and tenderness faced with what is insurmountable or, or terrifying or what cannot be withstood. So he does teach us in that way, you know, maybe to, to continue thinking, you know, on your train of thought. He does teach us in this moment of great violence that we're in how to continue um, that tenderness. Um, and maybe I can say a little bit of what I mean by that tenderness. Um, and it really goes through all his work. It's, or his, his artistry or however you want to call it. Um, it's the logic of the idiot. Um, it's a, an inscription into the material. Um, it's at the same time the content of his work, so this proximity to the material, and it's a, also uh, a function of his, uh, you know, the way that the work functions. So I would say yes, just quickly maybe to respond. Um, he does teach us about a great uh, tenderness uh, as a mode of response to this world and a mode of engagement. Um, and there's a lot more to say about that tenderness. Um, he speaks about it at length uh, in a, a lot of different ways. So um, yeah, but maybe I'll end there. If you want me to continue on that, I can. But I just, there's a tenderness, but there's also a manifestation of exploitation, of servitude, um, you know, a world of slavery, or a world in which a form of slavery is manifested. So how do you see the interaction between that tenderness and that rawness? of what he described. Uh, yeah, so he, you know, he always struggled with that uh, conflict, which is how do we as sentient beings deal with the violence of sentience? We can also frame it another way. How can uh, the white man deal with the, the history of uh, colonialism and exploitation uh, and capitalism. And so how, you know, how does that wound or how does that violence, how is that violence lived? Um, and what I find is really strong with his work and what I guess for me is really the most poignant um, element is that he always approached it with absolute vulnerability. I remember at the beginning of Coma, um, he is at a, a theater production, and I think he maybe is with uh, Stephen, I don't know. Um, I think you're here, Stephen uh, Barber. I think he's with you at that performance. Um, and he's watching these Balinese um, dancers, and he says, I am trembling for um, these actors, and as I tremble, I am already, as I empathize with them, I'm already beneath them. So there's a link between this 
possibility of empathy, which I guess has to do with the larger question of sentience or life, or life and the um, huge, you know, uh, relationship to violence that's so problematic. So it's already inscribed in that question of awareness or tenderness. And one image I have in my head of how to understand that is, you know, the flesh, which is okay, you cut into the flesh and in order to deal with that uh, pain or suffering, you have to have supernatural tenderness or infinite tenderness, you know? Um, so I guess that's how I would begin to see that um, combination. And I think the notion of empathy is really, really key. Don't you think, Nora? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I, think the yes. I mean, you know, it's, it's of everything. absolutely. He had. That's what I mean when I say he had a child's vision, um, and that's really a compliment, you know, for him because of, over the course of a life spent dealing with the most abject misery and you know, dealing with it uh, profoundly in his body and in his uh, mental, you know, to the point of really derailing his mental health, he maintained this uh, joyful freshness. And that is because I think he was, he is really, or was really in contact with a, a tenderness of awareness. Mm -hmm. Paul, yeah. how do you react to this? Uh, <laughs> To this empathy, this tenderness. Because I'm very curious because this is also something that um, does speak to your own work as well, this empathy and this tenderness and this violence. Um, wow, there's, there's so many things uh, in Gita to think about and so many um, confusions for me. Um, and at it, the heart of one of the confusions, and it's been a confusion for, for quite some time for me, and that's the, 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 the portraying of um, violence, and um, that that portraying, I, I've said a while back, somebody asked me why I was making such that kind of work, and I did say, it just popped out of my mouth. I, I said that it did have to do with uh, feeling something for the other in the violence that's being, that's occurring and having empathy. And that empathy was at the core of it for me. Um, and it popped out of my mouth, the word empathy. Um, and you know, uh, with with uh, the subject of Gita and this, uh, you know, this, uh, I was thinking as we were talking about the society, uh, the society, and and violence within this society, the capitalist consumer colonial society and um, this machine. And in a way, you know, um, Gita is, there's a resistance to that machine and uh, an empathy for those that suffer under the machine. And then it, what happens, and it's always like these words like, the, the the word repetition or the word abstraction and um, then at the same time seeing that as part of this apparatus of the machine and then at the same time within his art he uses those things um, in the expression the use of repetition and abstraction and so it's, you know, in, in, in the same way, for me, the depiction of, of the violence of 
and going into that has to do with both the attraction to it, which he describes, and um, and then the horror of it at the same time. So in that attraction and horror exists the confusion, and the you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I then, of course, what was just being said about Gita, the person and the tenderness. I mean, I was just talking to my son, Damon, and that came up with Damon about him as a person and the tenderness and the kindness of Gita. And then uh, there's the thing of the myth of Gita, the myth of of his life, uh, you know, uh, the the stories that follow his life that made him a mythical character too. The the Algerian War being put into the being, uh, put into isolation, the, the, the coma, the nearly dying, all this, all this that is mythical about him. And, uh, and then at the same time, that part that's mythical, in a way, in the mythical that becomes part of, uh, of his notoriety and and notoriety. I mean, maybe, you know, especially in certain areas of the world, but the notoriety. And then at the same time is the reclusive person and the realness of every one of those events. Like there's notoriety, there's uh, mythical, there's uh, sensational, there's, uh, and then there's the real reality of what he experienced and the real reality of his work, that it, it's the struggle with uh, who we are as human beings. And, uh, and at, uh, you know, at the core, the struggle of our violence and the struggle of our, uh, I don't know, anyway, maybe. <laughs> You can ask me another question or just move on. <laughs> I'm going to ask you another question and we'll move on to, to Catherine. Um, I think what also interests you is this moment, space of blurring between the reality and fiction. And the fact that fiction isn't a separation from reality. It's a more intense, you know, perhaps more accurate version of reality and you can think of this you know for example in his drawings which were fictional scenes but at the same time you could see some figures some people he had seen and it was always a transformation but it was always completely real as well as completely uh reinvented so how do you feel towards that paul um well, the one thing, what? No, no. What'd you say? Okay. Completely um, real, completely reinvented. Um, I mean, there's, I don't know. I mean, one thing is the form that he chose. I mean, he chose writing and drawing. I mean, those seem, and film, I guess, to some degree, but writing and drawing. So in that, he, and, and you know, they're very, um, both mediums are, are, there's a certain isolation to them. I mean, the drawings are small. They, you you can tell you know like of his where he lived is a small little alcove like cave like thing that the drawings existed on a small table as did the writing so there's the form of uh, 
of him sitting and writing onto a page, a typewriter or handwritten, and then drawing and it, it existing in a small area and then the focus between his head down to the paper, right? So there's the form that he chose, and it, it's a, it's a, it's a, to go into a, a kind of fantasy, I guess, where he could isolate himself, lock himself in, sit, sit or lay down, however, and then between him and that piece of paper, the, it's the media. It's it's a, and both of them similar. Uh, the piece of paper, nearly the same size as the typewritten piece of paper, the drawing, the size of the drawing. And uh, very, really cellular, like enclosed. And he, he chooses that because it, it, it allowed him to go into that uh, state of mind, that that cell that he put himself into. That's how I see it. Oh. Um, it, it it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a world of the mind. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not as physical. He doesn't act it out per se. He acts it out in his mind. Um, and, uh, so in a way, it, and I think it's very, that whole subject of how he made the, the, the thing of creating a story before he does the drawing. Um, so that, and I'm not sure how the writing was done, but it's a kind of projection out of his mind. Um, and then I'm sure it's a projection then is as he writes or as he draws, it's activated. So the process of writing or drawing is an action to activate the, the fantasy. Uh, the, um, in this case, uh, the, a projection into another reality, you know. Uh, I think, I think he describes it like that. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a particular type of practice. Not everyone chooses that practice, but it's, uh, it's, uh, an, aesthetic, uh, very monk, monkish. I don't know. No, I don't know. Anyway, he's in a I'll, cave. I'll, well, there, I'll, I'll, cave. well I, I can argue with that. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to this maybe a little bit later. But you use this beautiful phrase, it's a world of the mind. And for me, that's something Catherine can react to very clearly. So maybe Catherine, we well, would love to hear you because you have a very provocative argument on the life of the mind of Pierre Guillotin. Although, life of the mind, thanks to Pierre Guillotin. Maybe un unmute yourself, unmute yourself, you're mute. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this conversation. I'm very pleased uh, to um, celebrate uh, Pierre's memory. Um, so, I would like to maybe uh, narrate a little bit why I wrote this text about coma and how it was like uh, a few years ago Donatien uh, directed a, a special issue of the uh, French journal Critique and uh, each of the contributor, contributors were, was assigned a specific book by Pierre uh, and I was a bit disappointed because I was assigned coma uh, and this because uh, I had done some work about the brain and I was disappointed because at the time <clears throat> this was not the guillotin I loved because coma is written in what he called 
normative language, which is normal French. And I was more uh, keen to his books in uh, Griota's French. That is this uh, beautiful language he invented each time. So in the beginning I said, oh my God, what, what will I say about Koma that is more traditional, not only in its language, but also in its narrative. It's about um, the episode of his own coma when he fell ill and then he recovered. So I found the narrative interesting, but quite banal uh, until I found this sentence and Nora will read the, the passage a bit later. Uh, that says, in English, I think it is, uh, what I add to the embryo may not be uh, from that world. I hope I tr I'm translating well. So I said, what does that mean? Uh, and then I started dissociating embryo from not from that world. So I asked myself, what does he mean by embryo? And then I discovered that his definition of embryo uh, was multiple because embryo in the book uh, means the fetus, of course, but also the gene, so something that comes before the fetus. Also the talent, that is the, the genius, uh, his own genius. And so it designates a, a series of a multiplicity of times that he summarizes as the before. So before, and I started wondering before what? Is it before life really? Uh, or is it before birth? Or is it before, before life? So a kind of past that was made of a series of uh, layers of time. And then when I interrogated the other side of the, of the phrase, which is uh, not from that world, say, so what does he mean by, by that? Huh? In, in which world is he living? Or what kind of uh, future did he give to this improbable past? Yeah. And so the not from that world could mean that he was already dead, that he regarded his work as already past, that he never really existed. So a series of hypotheses uh, that the more, well, the more I thought about them, the more I tried to understand them, the more I discovered that they were absolutely non-logical, absolutely impossible to situate, and that they were forming, once again, a kind of uh, crazy temporality. And then I asked myself, what is it about? I mean, what is he talking about? Uh, and this is the moment when I, in fact, uh, discovered how lucky I was to have been assigned uh, this text. Because to me, it meant that he was precisely describing or inventing what coma was, what a coma was. Mm -hmm. That he was not only writing about coma or narrating his own experience of coma, uh, as I thought in the beginning, and that's why I was disappointed. No, he was inventing the language of coma. And uh, in my text, I, I formulated the hypothesis that maybe he was, uh, uh, for the first time, inventing something like a neuro literature, like the, 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 the literature of the brain, you know, of, of what happens when, when we are uh, in coma, that is uh, somewhere in between life and death, somewhere in between being someone and being no one, uh, in being like a return to the embryo, or maybe a time before that, and say, wow, so in fact, he's um, not only mm, taking coma as its object, but also as his uh, subject in a, in a certain sense. So yes, this is uh, uh, how I can answer your question. Well, and that was a very that was a very radical argument. I would love to hear you, Nora, who translated that book, respond to what Catherine's interpretation is. Yeah. What do you I, make of I, this new religion? I remember reading your text from Critique, and I really uh, appreciated that. Um, it's um, you know um, he is inventing as he is doing and it's part of the performative aspect of his method exactly and, exactly you know he's inscribed in a conversation i don't even i don't know if we can call it a conversation or a a tradition maybe or even a material tradition that 
comes from the Gospel of John. And, you know, in the beginning was the word. And he really is uh, inscribed in that. So um, he, the books that you were really attached to, the books in Long, not in the normative language, mm -hmm. but in the language that he's inventing, for him, those are active um, books in the sense that they uh, depict the friction of bodies and what occurs in the friction of bodies, which is life, you know, co copulation, basically. And so they are a doing, they are, you know, language that is making or a, a, a making of language on itself. They, they're a creative act. So um, absolutely. And what's interesting too, is that it's very hard to navigate his work because it's so full of paradox, you know? And so we can extract ourselves a little and say, okay, all of this time, time frames and coma doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Um, this is what it means. It means that we are in the time of coma in between or beyond time or before, you know? But at the same time, what I find interesting and really difficult, and I've always struggled with this, and I guess this echoes what Paul was saying about the paradox, is that it's a logic of proximity. I guess this is the closest I've come to understanding it. And maybe I could say, but I'd be interested to continue talking about this, maybe it'd be like an organic language, but I don't know what that would mean, you know. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I have all of my ideas straight about what I'm saying with organic. But, but what do you mean by proximity? I mean that um, the logic moves from, um, he'll say one thing and then it directly goes to something else. And so okay. it can become illogical, but it's like can push something from one extreme to the other just because, through this kind of logic of proximity. This comes to here, this goes to here. It's also a performative logic. It's just like, what comes through his head and what follows, you know, from one to the other. But it's, um, it's the way that he can combine absolute beauty with absolute violence, or that he can make coexist this great tenderness and a bordello scene where, you know, he says, this is supernatural tenderness that I am doing with these figures when I put them together in this friction of bodies. So, that's how I understand that. And for me, it, translating it, and I guess with Pierre, it's like being inside that illogical, fusionary, creative process before being able to extract any kind of vision from it. So you're just like stuck so close to it. You're inside in that act. Yeah. I think there's something that's quite interesting, which is going back to what Paul was saying, you know, about being locked in. That's true, but only to a certain extent. For example, a number of the drawings were made on the windows of his apartment and he would put them on the windows and that's why they would have some stickers and things like that. And I, I think the image of the drawings happening on the window is really interesting. I literally own the window, on the glass of the window. Mm -hmm. Because what it means is that it basically is a threshold place between the inside and the outside, that's completely inside, but also in a way already outside. And, you know, what I was really struck by, you know, speaking to him is that he had, and that's why we did the conversation book together, uh, Uma Paraza, Humans by Chance, in which he says we are, only, we are humans only by chance, is that he has, the way, he has a way to see things that from another person's point of view is very, very strange, but that is completely right. And that's the, the sort of strange tension that he manages to keep. You know, if any other person had seen things and seen things the way he would, it, would may, it maybe would seem strange or weird, but it made sense. And so he saw between anything he would see, he would see the underlying motive, the underlying atom, the, the cosmology that was related to it. And I, that I think is quite, quite distinctive. And maybe I would love to hear you Catherine and you, Paul, you know, maybe respond to that. This sort of way of existing at the threshold of everything. Paul, do you want to say something? Oh, I, had to, I was thinking about that. I'm not sure yet. Um, yeah, well, 
No, not yet. <laughs> I don't know what I have to say about that yet. Um, okay, so maybe Catherine and then Paul, you respond? Yeah, uh, sure. we will see what happens. Um, I was also struck, yeah, you're right, the threshold. And also, um, going back to the, to the issue of time, I was uh, very struck by the fact that the threshold was also uh, between um, individual temporality, his own life, and also the historical life. Because he, he also talks in that text about um, uh, the past of all people, what he calls the past of all people, like the uh, prehistory um, of the world. And he talks about an ice age that is very close to um, his own vision of the pre-embryonic stage. So this is also something I liked very much, I like very much in his work, is this constant interaction between history and personal uh, biography. I think this is um, another, yes, another interaction, another threshold that is so important. And that is, uh, I think, considerative of his notion of life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And also it's time to the family, the history of his family that was so foundational. His family, mm -hmm. his two uncles, you know, were very important, very prominent members of the French resistance and, and a part of his family died in deportation. So it's been already, you know, a lot of people think that Tomb of 500,000 Soldiers is a book about the Algerian experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not. And if there is a starting point, it's the Second World War, as much as the Algerian experience. And, um, and that's what this book starts with. Um, and so it's quite interesting because you, I agree with you. You have these layers of time and you have this all constant tackling with the most intimate part of what constitutes a human being and his, history. History which he would always write with a capital H. True. So and also what uh, Nora was, also, was saying about the biblical uh, narratives. It's a kind of uh, uh, mingling between the Bible, history and personal life. Um, yeah, and he also had no judgment about administrative forms of life. I mean, he was really interested in administrative language. He embodied the role of the official state-sponsored artist very much at the end, even though he was a complete uh, renegade and rebel, you know. So he really, um, that's also what I mean by tenderness or a kind of freshness of awareness. He didn't have a lot of preconceived notions about all of these, you know, we could call them forms of life or forms of language. Um, he was interested, mm -hmm. genuinely interested in uh, pursuing them and understanding them and inhabiting them. Maybe Paul, you want to react before I, I want to, well, then I also want to talk a bit about cosmology, but. I mean, I was thinking, yeah, there's an acceptance and, uh, but there's also uh, part of it, and he talks about it, a resistance and a, a rejection. And, you know, I was thinking that, you know, in his history is, are the uncles part of the resistance? And that, that in some ways maybe is an influence. Uh, I mean, he's, there is the society that he is, that he resists, that he rejects, that he wants to reinform, like to change language from what he sees as a, a, a sterile environment that uh, censors, the, the subject of censorship and holding the human, holding the body down, holding life down. And um, uh, that there's, there's the attempt to liberate and that both making the work is, is to, to see uh, to to see or to enter this uh, 
this machine that holds and uh, doesn't allow the potential of the human or the body to, to come out. And it's to show that, and at the same time, by showing that, he creates a view of the liberation of it. So um, there's the part of him as uh, with empathy and openness, and then there's the part that that is uh, resisting this uh, the the stifling uh, society, the stif the the society that forms the fascism or the in, you know the at the core of maybe uh, Giatai is World War II, is, uh, you know, that, um, you know, is it about the Algerian war or is it about World War II? And um, so the real, that whore, all the horrors of war. But uh, so I think, um, you know, and I was also thinking when, the subject of, of, of uh, that famous quote about uh, not of this world, you know, what is, what is the quote again about the embryo? It's the famous one. What is it? Uh, what I add to this world, no, sorry, what I add to the embryo is not uh, of may this not, world. May not be of this world. Yeah. May not be of this world. Yeah, and I was, you know, it, it's all of, a lot of this is up to, you know, like wherever your own, you're at yourself. For me, it's like, uh, I, I, I kind of interpreted it that it, not of this world meant you could see it, and I, it's could totally be wrong, but in a way I see it, it times not of this world that somehow he perceives he's saying or maybe that's there's a type of perception of um uh, not of this world is to see or to to form the language to form a new language to to a new way of the body to be uh, 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 with you know, outside of the of the of the world we're in, like uh, as if there's another way of being, and in a certain way, I, he 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 was he created that other world, you could say, or this idea of an artist creating another world in which they live in and uh so uh, you know i could kind of see for myself that he might be talking about the world that he's created outside of of uh this world so as opposed to uh, seeing it as the voice of the coma I see it as the voice of the imagination, oh. the world that he created, or I think he did live. I mean, when I was saying about the drawing and the piece of paper, I, you know, for me, it, it's if he takes it to the window, it it's still within that cell that he has. And, uh, but it's interesting that he took it to the window, you know, the, that you're so aware in his apartment, in that small room, how he sees the very direct outside of that apartment. That there's the apartment, it's very, and how the bed is, everything, and that table. It's so, and then that view out into that, courtyard and how he sees that courtyard itself as something of you know that's really interesting to me that there's this room and the room has the glass sheet it's 
the window that looks out onto this uh, courtyard and how he sees that courtyard and how he talks about it and how he, you know, and then you go into the room. So these layers too of his apartment, the direct courtyard outside the apartment, and then the larger subject of this world, you know. Can I respond to that um, quickly? Um, it's so interesting to, for me to, to have that image because I understand his work as a radical refusal of fantasy. Um, it's a materialist project. Um, he, he does it in a lot of different ways. He writes through his body. He writes through the ejaculate of the sperm. He's inscribing it materially. He is reliving the horror of starvation in his body. He's empath empathetically reliving or living the horrors of colonialism. Um, he is going against the metaphor. I mean, those are all questions from Telquer at the time, but he's radically really acting that refusal of fantasy. So, I, you know, the relation to the camps is like, okay, what is this? What do we see? What is the reality of this situation? And not a, a, a phantasmatic projection. So at the same time, he is absolutely in his cell, and I agree with you. And, you know, I remember seeing him, like, walk across the street and be elaborating his world and then i was like okay i need to you know pull him because he's gonna get hit by a car i mean he really was like that completely disconnected but at the same time it was an absolute uh, assault against fantasy so for me that's a really fascinating um question yeah, yeah. very true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in a way, if you think of his apartment, you know, on one side, you have the courtyard. On the other side, you have the Place du Trône, you know, where people were beheaded during the revolution. So it's this interesting balance between the inner space on the one hand and history. You know, he would always, you remember, Paul, when you visited him a couple of months ago, he would talk about André Chénier, you know, the French poet who had been buried nearby. It was always a slayer, but I do think that, you know, what is really extraordinary with his life and his work is how encompassing they were. You know, he was, you, you can talk about materialism and that's really true, but the level of spiritualism, you know, of invocation of all the dead that have been, all those who have suffered, all the lives, all the spirits, everybody was present at a given moment. And I do think that you can also say, you know, we've spoken about history, but what about futurism? You know, how futuristic his work is. And if you, you know, we remember Joyous Animals of Mystery, the book, the book that came out six years ago, um, you know, he talks about the megalopolis and really what he's describing is the, ne is the next future step of the state of the world. And so, in a way, what I think is really extraordinary is that it's very, very rare to meet someone and to meet a body of work that has everything like this, you know, most, most modernist, most traditional, and everything at such a high level of intensity. And maybe before we take a few questions, if you want to react to that, Catherine, Paul, Nora. Um, I think uh, you're totally right. Uh, done, but at the same time, I think this does not preclude what uh, Nora was saying. I, I, I totally agree with her that okay, it's a futuristic work, etc. But I think there is no fantasy in it. Um, I totally agree that he doesn't use metaphors. He's very. I, I would say that he doesn't like images in in the in the vulgar sense of the term. Um, so imagination, I think, is not his uh, cup of tea, I would say. So I, I agree with this materialist um, yeah, definition of his uh, work. Paul? Um, I, 
I, I guess I, I don't understand what you mean by materialist because in a way it, it is a construction. Um, it's, it's connected to, to things of this world, but it's another construction. And it comes from this world, I, where else can it come, you know, but, or maybe I can't say that, but it's another construction. Yes, of course. So, so mm -hmm. it, 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 it's materialist in what way? Is it materialist because it, it's, it's, it's another form uh it's uh, so um uh, is it imaginary is it a state of imagination that he he goes into i don't mean it like you know at what point is there a reality in that in that construction that he's in, in that process of the construction what what part of that imagination takes on what form of reality and what is reality in in that fantasy or in that construction so um i'm saying that i'm saying that he's creating uh, another form of a uh, form of reality of some sort you know, yeah. that we can experience I mean the, yeah. we can we can go into the book and experience a reality his this form that he's made uh, um, I would maybe uh, use the word vision more than more than imagination yeah, because it, also it, could be, it could be in the, the language itself the, I mean the, the word you know like uh, imagination vision yeah. you know um because i think that in the notion of imagination what's interesting is image and i think what's quite interesting with the drawings too is that you know he tries to describe them he doesn't want to describe them as figurations of his world he doesn't want that because the world the world sorry this world cannot be turned into an image so it's, but, it, but at the same time, there's an ambivalence because he does make the drawing and they do have something to do with his world. So I think this well, threshold he, is really interesting. He also describes in the book uh, what someone wears, where they're positioned in space. Mm -hmm. He describes them. So mm -hmm. there is an image being made. So I would, I think his interest in film, I, it, you know, he, he, there's something where I think he really is interested in in the image, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you know, I mean, uh, his uh, the you know the Balinese theater, it's an image. The the Bunuel film, it's an image. Mm -hmm. I think that he's uh, he exists. How it actually operates, I don't know. Somebody else probably knows that much better. But the, the word, the image, and the fact that he makes a drawing, he made a drawing, he made an image. Yeah, I guess maybe I could say he's still inscribed in this aesthetic moment. And so he's producing works. He's not doing social practice. He's not doing, um, you know, he, he's still within that framework of producing objects. But within his framework, the objects have a scope and have an, an active effect that uh, exposes, explodes those bounds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's still making a book, he's making a language, he's making a, a drawing, but at the same time, the language is co-constitutive of a reality in the same way that a performative language is uh, outside of the bounds of that object. So if we look at it in terms of art history, yes, it is part of a modernist moment, it's not post-aesthetic, but it does grapple with those questions within that form. I guess that's how I see it. Well, in in one way, as human beings, I mean, we could say there's art and there's art history, and we can 
try to talk about we can try to talk about Gita in relationship to art and art history. But I think the point that he's trying to make is to go beyond all that. Like if we start talking about his futurism, it, it's like we have to get rid of all this. You know, like it's to go be, it's to form a new language and to how do we like, uh, you know, uh, to go like that's what he has this image he has he has that to try and communicate the same with like i don't know yeah like what when he says to reinvent language what is he saying in a way i think he's not saying it doesn't come down to whether an a looks like an a or a b looks like a b or a word looks like this I think he's saying that we have to reinvent language into a, a whole other concept of how we take something into our body. Hmm. It's, not know, it's, just, it's not just, you know, whether you don't put a paragraph or whether you don't put a, or whether it's a run on sentence. It's like, how the, how do we go beyond all this and how do we take something into the body and all he's got at this moment in time are these ob these things an image a letter a word that we we operate in language that way but maybe it's uh he's trying to get at something else and all we have is that you know? that's I mean, maybe I'll just say one final word on this before, you know, I think I've seen that there are a few questions. Um, you know, in the last month of, of his life as a human being, he was undergoing a very significant crisis uh, in his work. And the crisis was, how can you try to make art of the non-human? How can you go beyond the limit of the human being? Go to the atom. What is it to make art of the atomic structure? How can you do this? And for the last few months, he was trying to get there and was confronting a dead end, you know, in a way. And so in a way, what you're, what you're addressing, Paul, is exactly that. How do you manage to transform it and to go to the forms of life that are not just human, that are a greater life, a cosmological life, in which everything from the ground, from the soil to the stars, is all exists within one unique time. So maybe that's sort of the continuation of, of what you, you, you wanted to say. John, I think, I, I've seen there's a question, right? We have, what a, we have a few questions. So yeah, we can move to that now. Um, thank you all for, for this conversation. There are a lot of, a lot of hot words coming up. I loved threshold kept appearing. I think it's such an interesting, interesting jumping off point. Um, our first question comes from Raphael uh, Rubenstein. So let me see, Raphael, if I can see here. Raphael, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so I was wondering something that Donatien said at the very beginning about how much of uh, Guillotin's work had never been published, I guess, at his own, uh, out of his own choice. And I was wondering, I'd like to know, know more about that, like why, that, why he took that stance of, of being reclusive or rejectionist. And I was thinking how it reminded me of the um, similar stance of the artist Simon Hantai about the same time who mm -hmm. uh, withdrew from the art market. And anyway, I just was curious about that. Well, thank you. Uh, I think I think he would have killed us for saying he was reclusive, because he would always say that he wasn't reclusive at all. You know, I mean, that's the question. Uh, let's say he would go through different phases. I think there's different. I mean, maybe I'll I'll say a few things, and if you want to jump in, Nora or Catherine, I think there are different cases. You know, one case is certain works that he didn't publish, but that were there. So for example, all his writings from his youth, they're unpublished before his first book that came out when he was 20, and he's kept them. 
and he considered publishing them at a given moment, and everything is at the French Public Library. Then there are certain texts that were too sensitive for him to publish them. And the key text is stories or histories, I don't know how we should say this, of Samora Machel, you know, the revolutionary from Mozambique, which is his great, one of his great masterpieces that hasn't been published because he touched upon parts of his, you know, own life that was that were too sensitive. They couldn't get out uh, in the world. And then there are things that are there that he didn't publish because he moved on to the next thing. So for example, there are some theatrical pieces like, um, um, uh, there are also, there's this project he did, which you're very interested in, Nora, with Daniel Buren. And, you know, that project was never published. And, you know, Daniel Buren said to him a couple of years ago, but could we publish it? And Pierre said, you know, that's fine. It can be published. And then I asked, do you want, are you happy with it being published? And he said it belongs to the past, which means that it was something that could go out in the world, but that he didn't want to see go out in the world at that moment. And then there is, another strata. Then there are all the shorter texts that he had there that he was working on, uh, which are finished, and that, but they weren't the next big thing he was going to tackle. And then there is a war ensemble, and that's his notebooks, which he kept for over 50 years, 50, um, yeah, 60 years actually. And only the first volume was published in 1962 to 1967. But 1967 to 2020, every day, almost every day, in the last years, every day, he would keep notes. And this is, remains to be published and is supposed to be published according to specific protocols. For example, he, doesn't want, he didn't want people who were too close to him and on whom he could have moments of anger to be included. So it really becomes a sort of um, you know, diary of writing, of living, of composing. So each of them has a different status. And regarding his reclusiveness, I mean, he was a person of extreme intensity. And the thing is that so many things could touch him and could be very, could have a very direct impact on him. And so when you have that level of intensity, I do think that you have to protect yourself a little bit. When you go down on the street, you will see, I mean, what he would do, that he would see the life of every person that was on the street with him would go through their biography, partly with what he would see, partly reimagining it. So when you are at that level of intensity, well, it's complicated to, 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 to have that many uh, interactions, I would say. But he did have quite, you know, quite a lot, paradoxically. No, that answer, you're good, but maybe you want to add something yeah. more. No, oh, thanks very much. That does Pleasure. clarify things for me. Thanks, sir. Um, our next question comes from Anna Vitale. So let me unmute you, Anna. Let's see. Anna, are you there? Yes, I am here. And um, I had a question for Catherine. Uh, I was hoping you could say more about how you think about the embryo or the pre-embryonic in the context of coma language. Um, in the context of coma language, okay. Well, thank you. Um, hello, Anna. Hi. <laughs> um, let me see, because um, uh, I'm looking to the text I wrote. Uh, it was based on three uh, quotes by Guyota. The first one was about genes, so it was uh, describing uh, the embryo as uh, the genetic beginning of life. Uh, the second one is this kind of prayer he addresses his mother to take him back into her womb. And the last one is the reference to the night uh, during which he was conceived by his uh, parents. So, uh, in fact, these three passages are not um, coherent, I mean, because they refer to different times. So that's why uh, that put me on, the, on my way. I mean, uh, to try to understand, you know, this kind of hesitation about the beginning, this kind of uh, uh, inca incapacity to remember exactly or to situate exactly uh, the kind of time he was talking about. And this, this brought me to the idea of coma. Because it was so fuzzy, you know. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Anna. 
Um, our next question comes from Fang Bu. Fang, you can unmute yourself, right? Thank you. Hello, Donna Chair. Hey, Fang. Wow, oh, cool shades, Fang. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Catherine, and I love your translation, Nora. Um, so Vera sent me a copy. And, and I remember when we hosted the film that Sylvia did right after our friend who, you know, Paul Rubilio passed away in 2008. And in the course of watching the film, I couldn't help but think of Trump in the sense that we know Paul was a brilliant philosopher who philosophical, you know, enterprise is really studying about speed and power and whatnot. And in the, and some point he say, uh, if time is money, speed is power. This is why we are constantly in a race. And humility is tomorrow virtue. Humility is truth. And the reason why I'm saying that because how do we see that in reference to um, Pierre's sense of you know, gentleness, gentility. So that is a very, it, it compels me, particularly now because I just realized it took me a while to um, study how Mussolini have learned to mobilize speed and power or technology from, from you know, uh, Manoretti, because he met Manoretti uh, before futurism uh, political party was created. And from greatest power is really how to mobilize speed. You know, his tweak, storm and all that. But I really wanted to ask, particularly with Pierre's gentle sensibility and, and Paul um, speed and, and redeem speed is really about humility. That's how he felt. What is the potential way of repudiate speed is humility. Does that make sense, Donatian? Um, yeah, it does. It does. I mean, but I do think it sort of leads to many. It lo It sort of leads on many, many tracks, because you know he was somebody. He is somebody who, in a certain way, is extremely traditional. You know, mm -hmm. he. Uh, you know, uh, Paul compared him to a monk. He had the sort of father. You know, religious father figure. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand. It's really interesting how within remaining within that way of existing, he embraced technology, was one of the first right offers to use computers. And actually, one thing we didn't talk about, which is really interesting, is that he invented a new way of archiving. Mm -hmm. I think he's the first offer was text messages, emails, were immediately downloaded to the archive of France's public library, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Which means that when you were writing to Pierre, when he was writing to you, you knew you would end up in history in Francis Public Library, which is really interesting. And so in a way, you know, what he had also a very generous way, very gentle way, very demanding way at times of looking at the world. And if you think, I was just thinking about actually about this in more general terms about our time. You know, what does Pierre mean for our times? You know, he sure is the French James Joyce in a way, in a more intense, you know, he's a great French modernist, uh, in arguably a more grander way than James Joyce. Joyce. But what he means really is that many issues that we're dealing with, such as how we live, how we relate to one another, how we can be kind to one another, how we can pay attention, including to the people we dislike, which he was often doing, he would often pay very significant attention to the, the political ideas of his antagonists. You know, how you can manage all that and how you can just live with attention while embarking on a very ambitious epic of servitude. Mm -hmm. All that at the same time. But maybe, Paul, you want to say something? No, no, I was just, my computer, I just lost connection. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> okay, that's kind of went gone. Everything was gone. But, but it's back. I have to excuse myself because I have to go to, um, class. So I really apologize, um, but I have to leave. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. It was really wonderful um, to see all of you. And I really hope that we can continue this 
um, it just whetted my appetite and I realized that I, I missed this conversation as much as I miss Pierre. So uh, thank you all so much. We can do part two, you, Nora. We can do part two. Thank you, Nora. Great, yeah. Bye. Nice. I think we have uh, one more question. If everybody's everybody's good for one more, yeah. Okay. Cool. We have one from Justin. Let's see, Justin, you should be unmuted now if you want to ask. Yeah. Oh no, still muted. Unmuted. Okay. Justin, Thanks. you go. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I was really enjoying the sort of back and forth. Um, between um, Pierre's relationship to what is fantasy or or a relationship to the image and thinking about uh, writing about the future without the imaginary and sort of well, then was struck by what Catherine said in terms of thinking about the image in the most vulgar sense of the word and I kind of was curious what um, you sort of meant by that and then maybe thinking a little bit more about you know the construction of image and fantasy and or the imaginary in those relationships. Yes, thank you very much. You, you're totally right. I should have been much more specific about that. Uh, what I meant is, you know, the, the classical uh, distinction between the proper sense and the metaphorical and how the writers are supposed to uh, create metaphors and images in that sense. Uh, that is to figure uh, their own world. Um, and so, I mean, it is true that if you look at any text by Pierre, I think you won't e even be able to find one metaphor. You know? So I, I totally agree with Paul that at the same time, this is, this is a, a, a totally fantastic world, but, but it is a world, strangely enough, that does not use uh, the resources, uh, the rhetorical sources of the metaphorical. This is what I meant. And I, I agree also with Nora when she said uh, that m much of this uh, creative power comes from the experience of his own body. Mm, More than a kind of uh, invention of images. Um, well, I don't think it's an invention of images. I think it's an invention it's an invention of creatures. And we, we haven't, that's for the next conversation, but he really invented a taxonomy of creatures. And each creature behaves according to certain rules. And we, we're only just dwelling, literally dwelling, on the immense complexity of this system of creatures he is invented, you know. And, and I do, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of a bit divided because I do think that as Paul was saying, film, the creation of, you know, if you look at the very beginning of Topher 500,000 Soldiers, it's a film. You know, you sort of go close up. It's structured, as, and Pierre himself who talked about it being structured as a film, as in Eden, Eden, is in Eden, Eden, Eden also. But you have that, but you don't have, it's, it's vision. That's why I said visions, because the vision as a, something very direct that comes to you rather than an image that has a construction. So even though, if you look at the drawings, what's quite interesting is that you can also see that tension in the drawings. Because some of the drawings are this creature. That's just a creature. And some of them are quite carefully constructed scenes. You know, you can see that he's putting this detail and that detail and creating the story behind it. So in a way, I think what's interesting also with his work and with his conception of everything, including identity, is it's, it was very fixed, but it is very fixed but also very fluid. That's the interesting thing. Because certain aspects we can, it is true that you can say that mostly he didn't want it to be constructed as an image, but sometimes there are experimental moments in the relationship to film, on which Stephen, you know, has, Barbara has written extensively, you know, is also something that, that exists, as well as other things. Donna Chia, uh, maybe everybody can, can um, answer my question. I, in regard to Algerian war, do you know that it's set, it, once Chartres and, and Camus were best of friends, but then, then the whole issue of, with social class structure separated them because Chartres came from upper class 
and Camus from a working class. How does that, how does that rep refer to, to Pierre? Have that ever surfaced in your conversation with him a little bit? I mean, I mean, you know, what he did with the Algerian war is that it's kind of an, it's a very interesting story because he could have not gone. He could have decided, he could have arranged not to go. And to a certain extent, he decided to go. But then when he was there, he was utterly shocked by, you know, the brutality of the army, the brutality of the treatment of the Algerians uh, by the army, um, you know, the, the absurdity, the sheer absurdity of the hierarchy of the army, as well as having a deep empathy for his fellow soldiers who were as lost as he was. And in a way, what he did is that he went there, he agreed to go there. He decided not to become uh, a ranking officer, which he could have done. He decided to remain a soldier with the communists, and then he rebelled. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he was considered to side with the Algerians, which he then did for two decades. You know, he went to Algeria a lot, went to, went to, uh, went to the Sahara a lot. And, and so what's quite interesting is this decision, this, the fact that he went there, he could have not done it, he decided to go, and then he rebelled. So I think the class, I mean, it's very different because in a way, you know, Camus, having, been, having grown up there, you know, also there was also the relationship between the fact that he was kind of a colonizing force. Pierre was somebody coming from, you know, the hills, uh, in Beau-Argental, um, and then having spent a bit of time in Paris, that was there with soldiers and that wanted to be with the others, but that with the other soldiers in their mystery, but could not accept the absurdity of the war and of the, of the pressure yield upon the, upon the, the pressure held upon the Algerians and the torture and all this was just impossible for, and then he rebelled. Yeah. But what's interesting, and maybe I'll, I'll, well, I'll end on this, is Faulkner. Because, you know, what he, that's the moment when he was in his, in his, and he describes it in Idiocy, which is coming out within a few months in the US, he described Faulkner and the language of Faulkner and the language of the oppressed as having been a key for him. And in a way, you know, some people said that in the writings of the 70s, you can hear the Algerian, you know, Algerian or Northern African accent. That's true, but really what it is, is all the accents of all the voices of all the oppressed. I think there's something along that same lines, maybe it made me think that one thing is, is he's, to some degree, he's in, this, in the society, in the world, and in another way, he's in his own world. So this thing of the 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 apartment the window the outside the out the bigger outside and him not wanting to be labeled as a recluse but wanting to see that he's on the outside as and then at the same time he's really insular and is in the inside in his own uh, environment um, mm -hmm. and uh, into a degree reclusive, he's reclusive as well as seeing himself on the outside. But as this, and I see it this way, it's I, whether it's whatever it is really in his reality or how you read, I see it this way. As a, this recluse or as this person withdrawn from society as well as in society, He's in the position of being and is a, a form of a, a creator of a language of some sort, of maybe a new language, but he's, he's in this mode. And it's, you're very aware that he's rejected. Uh, he's in that, when you see that world, you're very aware that he has rejected, in a lot of the sense, any attempt to be to have possessions the ownership these aren't things he's concerned with it seems to me so yeah. his position is not if you describe as uh, the working class and an upper class his position in my view is outside of either one of those 
-hmm. but he chooses to have a life where, I mean, his life doesn't involve these material things that either the working class ascribes to or the upper class has. He's just outside of all of that. And uh, then the question is, in his work, how does he uh, involve, or how does he describe all that? And uh, it seems that a lot of it is, uh, these positions of power uh, and uh, victims, victims and power and oppressors, it, uh, there lies maybe this, he carries on a discussion, but the discussion, yeah, yeah, he carries on some sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know. Temporary autonomous zone, yes, thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Paul, Dancien, Kathleen. That was a great conversation, um, and I, I'm sure we're all, we're all, Everyone in here shares my enthusiasm for digging back into to Pierre's work um, after this. We're going to close, um, as is customary, with a reading, this time from our intrepid managing director, Charlie Schultz. Charlie, can I unmute you? Oh, there you are. Thanks, John. Thanks, Paul, Danashian, Catherine. This has really been uh, incredibly inspiring. Um, I can't go out, I can't wait to read uh, as much as there is that exists for a poor, impoverished monolinguist like myself. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be reading an excerpt from Coma today that was actually uh, translated by our guest who had to depart early to go to class, Nora Weidel. Um, this book is Coma. It was originally published in 2006. Um, the excerpt was selected. I still cannot get used to the idea that talent, genius even, must be taken into account. What I add to the embryo is perhaps not of this world. Often, too often perhaps, the greatest actions of human history, the greatest works, the greatest discoveries, which I love and from which I garner strength, seem unworthy in regard to what I believe with all my heart man to be capable of. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Donny. Thank you all. And join us tomorrow for, um, at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for a discussion uh, with Ami Le and uh, Dr. Lucy um, Bodich, which should be super interesting. Um, and you're all able to unmute yourselves now if you'd like to say goodbye on your way out. Thanks so much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks, John. Thank you very Thanks, much. Paul. Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Right, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. 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 Thank you.